Secret Longevity Lifestyle Designers. This is Gummin here at secretsoflongevity.com. A very popular topic or subtopic within the debates that go on between vegans and omnivores is this idea of dentition or more specifically the canine teeth in humans and whether or not their size or lack thereof is indicative of past dietary habits or even what our present day habits should be. Now, I have addressed this several times in past videos and bring the point up and on occasion, but I wanted to do one just on this video because people need to hear it and people have low attention spans so they don't necessarily even get to that point in other videos I've done. As I see in the comments on those videos, people mention it, yet I already addressed the point in the video. It just shows the intellectual dishonesty of the vast majority of people within uh, dietary movements in general, the lack of scientific understanding of physiology and the basis and evolution and things like this. But we'll go over just those points I repeated, then I've come across some newer research, which I wasn't aware of before, around human canines and why they are the way they are nowadays in humans. So the points I would talk about in the past, which on their own just completely stamp out any idea that humans uh, are somehow adapted to a pure vegetarian diet is the fact that any animal out in the wild has different tools depending on its evolutionary history and also the different aspects and areas of its life. So I believe it's hippos who have the largest canines of any land animal, yet it is a almost exclusively vegetarian animal or herbivorous. It occasionally gets seen eating a crocodile or something bizarre, but those are very uncommon and not traditional parts of their diets, nor necessary parts of them. And again, we see a whole wide range of herbivores with prominent canines, and then we also see uh, certain attributes around the canines of predators that explain a lot there, and also the differences between primate uh, canines and actual predators is also indicative when you actually look at the physiology of these things. But this concept of tools, like you look at a giant squid, you don't see anyone saying, well, giant squid should be vegetarian or vegan because they lack canines. <laughs> the idea sounds preposterous. It's an animal in the wild doing its own thing. It has tools that it uses to catch prey. It's arms with the suckers on it. It has a beak-like mouth and it propels itself through the water in order to catch prey and to escape dangers from sperm whales and things like that. And the same goes for any animal that has tools at its disposal that is developed through evolution. So the major tool humans evolved to be able to hunt and consume larger quantities of animal foods over time, around 2.6 million years ago, we see that increase in animal food consumption, which I've thoroughly addressed in past videos with scientific references, is the brain. It grew bigger, and as a result, we learned to create tools in order to hunt. We didn't need claws, we didn't need to develop sharp teeth, we didn't need to develop poison, we didn't need to develop uh, flight. You know, any of these things could have helped in hunting, but it's the brain that allowed us to create uh, tools that would mimic to uh, claws or teeth or whatever would be necessary uh, to take down prey that we could then consume. So I'm not going to get into the biological traits of why it's obvious we're omnivores from a long time ago, around 2.6 million years ago we started consuming animal foods as the majority of calories in our diet, but I'm going to stick two videos of mine in the past below, in the links below. Uh, one, The first one, that describes the scientific proof that backs my claim of us having been omnivores for about 2.6 million years. And that's actually going back to before we were even considered human, modern human, anatomically modern human. Um, so that's several species back. And that second link below is my video on the physiology of humans and how it indicates what diet it is we're designed for, or at least most adapted to. Um, talking in broad definitions, not one size fits all diet for everyone on the planet, but the broad scope within what we all fall under. Uh, so that looks at, you know, is it omnivore, is it herbivore, is it frugivore, or is it carnivore? Uh, I think you probably already have an idea of what I'm making the claim as to what category we fall under. 
Uh, but that video really backs that claim up with the physiological adaptations that are very obvious that we see within uh, humans, but also addresses the common misperceptions and claims made around physiology that the sort of pure plant-based diet camps would like you to believe indicate uh, the evidence for their stance, which isn't really a scientific one, it's one of propaganda and misinformation. But to come back to canines, the fact that we didn't ever have prominent canines in recent human history is irrelevant, because if you don't use something, you don't develop it, or if you don't use it, you lose it. If we did have canines, if you go back far enough, we had bigger canines uh, when we were closer to fruitarians. And as we consumed more meat and started cooking our food, those receded big time because our dentition changed. Um, now to get into the ideas that kind of put canines outside of the realm of exclusively being a dietary tool in terms of catching prey, the thing that's never mentioned is the fact that chimpanzees have them, gorillas have them, baboons have them, and all these things consume far more plant foods than animal foods in their diet. Chimpanzees have the most animal foods out of those three species, uh, but for such a small amount of uh, animal foods in their diet, uh, why would they even have canines, one would think. But what it comes down to, in matter of fact, is that canines in daytime animals, or diurnal animals, that are active during the day, are almost exclusively across the board, no matter what species, a product of mating ritual or uh, competition between males to look fearsome, to even fight between them. And it's exclusively the nocturnal animals that have the canines for hunting, for catching the prey and holding it and you know piercing into the jugular when they have it by the neck and things like that. But the third link below is a s article about a study and just an excerpt from that. Among the anthropoid primates, meaning the most human-like ones, the highest orders of primates, it is well known that the canine teeth of males are up to four times as long as those of the females. And so this makes it obvious that this is an issue of competition between males. If the females have far shorter ones, they're not uh, using them. So they're biologically adapted to not needing them. It's not the fact that females catch less animals than males in these primates, because among gorillas, they don't even have any regular source of large prey that they would need them for. The argument among chimpanzees could be that the males do all the hunting, therefore they have the canine teeth for that purpose. Uh, but no, that's not the case. When the methods of hunting are examined among chimpanzees, they chase them down and basically pull their prey apart. They catch a monkey, they rip its arms off. They don't bite it to kill it the way a lion kills a gazelle or a what wildebeest and tries to pierce key veins in the neck. This is concrete evidence that's agreed upon by anthropologists and biologists of what's the evolutionary adaption and purpose behind canines within primates and especially humans. So the neat thing about humans is if you are familiar with the RK reproduction strategy of uh, animals in the wild, the closer you are to R-based reproductive strategies where you have the least amount of parental oversight on the raising of offspring, it's the lowest intelligence animals within the animal kingdom that use that method. And basically, as you move up the spectrum to K reproductive strategies, you go through progressively more intelligent animal species. They have bigger brains, they have more uh, attentiveness they give to their offspring, and they don't produce as much offspring in such large clusters. And so you can imagine bears, they spend a long time raising their young, you get further up, you have elephants, you have dolphins, chimpanzees, and then finally humans. We are at the top. We spend the most amount of time of any animal raising our young, we give birth to underdeveloped young that are basically in a state that in other animals, the animal at that state is still in the womb. So humans are born before being fully developed uh, enough to be able to survive on one's own. Plus there's all that time needed to develop as a child and uh, even a teenager that you need the parental oversight and help in order to survive. So what creates K reproductive strategies is pair bonding. And there's very few animals in the world that have actually developed pair bonding strategies for survival. There's a few of them and they might fall outside of this category of uh, where they lie on the RK reproductive strategy because they're not as intelligent. For example, penguins, they are more or less quite um, monogamous, but obviously penguins don't compare to humans on the intelligence factor, although they are 
very smart compared to a lot of birds. And gibbons aren't the smartest of the apes by a long shot, and they are one of the few monogamous apes besides humans. But humans are really the most, or one of the most monogamous animals, and that's why we have the institution of marriage. People will make the argument that we're not based on a whole assortment of things, but I've talked about this in the recent past and we'll be doing more videos on this in more depth in the near future as well. So there's a strong argument for monogamy and the fact that it produces more intelligent children and better chance of survival, as well as more cooperative and communally minded children. Uh, and because of that, the pair bonding eliminates the need for competition. So instead of having one male impregnating several females and he has to win over a number of other males, you have one-on-one -on -one couplings, which means all males get to reproduce more or less with one female. And so you have less competition between males for females. Maybe there's a little bit for the highest status females, which end up pair bonding with the highest status males. But beyond that, we don't have a lot of fight to the death occurrences within the human species anymore. Therefore, our canines shrunk over time because they weren't used uh, just in terms of the look to look more aggressive, but they weren't actually even used either in the fighting as you would see in say a baboon. Male baboons have massive canines, yet they do not use them for hunting. And you look at female baboons and it's pretty obvious the difference there. Uh, so that four times larger size is quite apparent within the baboon. And uh, yeah, this really completely knocks this outdated, over-repeated thing about humans because of their lack of canines, uh, somehow meaning that we shouldn't consume animal foods. It's absolutely ridiculous. Unscientific, and at this point I don't know what anyone would bring up as a counter to this, so if you do have something to say, definitely do your research and have a coherent point to respond with. Um, but yeah, you have to acknowledge the science when it's in your face, even if it's an emotionally uncomfortable truth. But let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Like, favorite, and share the video if you feel so inclined. It would be such a massive help. Consider supporting me on Patreon, which you can find at the links below as well. And with that, I'll talk to you again soon. Take care and embrace life without limits.